All across America, incredibly talented artisans make amazing objects the old-fashioned way, by hand. This episode of Handcrafted America puts the awe in authenticity. This is mind-blowing, people. Mind-blowing. In Arizona, all the cowboys crow over this man's cowboy hats. Would you have any other hat? No, ma'am. A piano maker in Maine makes all of this himself. All of it. Himself. Here's the keyboard in action for this 19th century Viennese piano. And in Wisconsin, this tinsmith's work was inspired by the 19th century, but will last well into the 22nd. It's simply true that everything old is new again. Beethoven would be proud. <laughs>
So, oh, but you can't come in here. What? Why? This is proprietary, so nobody's allowed in here. Is he joking? Even though he kicked me out, I like Eric. He and his hats definitely do America proud. I've always been very uh, patriotic, mm -hmm. and what's more patriotic than uh, the body? Eric Watson of Watson's Hat Shop is the cowboy hat maker in a very cowboy town. It definitely is a step back in time. This was actually settled by the Calvary during the mining time in the 1800s. Eric is keeping that Old West tradition alive with his beaver fur felt hats. And from what I've seen so far, his work is very impressive. We've shaped and steamed and ironed. But then Eric totally blocked me from his pouncing room. In hat making, pouncing is sanding the material until it's shiny and smooth. It's often done with fine grit sandpaper. Of course, I can't speak to Eric's methods. I can, however, speak to his results. Wow. It just has a nice smooth feel. Next, Eric's cutting the brim. Then we'll give the crown that signature cowboy shape. So this is actually an old wood hat block. It's a cattleman style hat block. And we're going to what we call block shape. OK, what is this going to do? This is going to, we're actually going to set the shape of the hat. OK. Pull it out lift it up right here. And this is a very common cowboy or cowgirl shape that's been used for 100 years, and they still want that shape still today. The felt still needs to dry, so in order to retain the look, he puts a wedge in the cleft on the crown and these cool earmuff-looking things on the sides. Letting it dry this way will permanently set the shape into the hat. So the next thing we have to do is we actually have to cut and sew the leather sweatband inside the hat. When it comes to cowboy hats, the sweatband has to meet pretty specific requirements. We'll use a two-inch sweatband, which is commonly found in a Western hat, simply because these are utility-type hats. So they have to last and hold up, and it helps protect against moisture and sweat. Eric, I have to say, this is quite the sweatband. It's goat hide leather. It's goat? Mm-hmm. Why do you use goat? The biggest reason is moisture resistant to sweat. It's very durable, holds up, and it's soft. Oh, it's, it is very, very soft. This mm -hmm. feels great. I love your logo here. Well, I've always been very uh, patriotic. Mm -hmm. And what's more patriotic than the, the bald eagle? First of all, let me talk about this machine. Oh, sure. This is amazing. This is actually made for hats. How old is this? 1920s. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> It's incredible. This stuff's rare. I can't even find another one like this. We fold this in, and then we'll lay that in there like that. That is beautiful. <laughs> Perfect. It almost looks like a cowboy hat. It just needs that signature bend at the rim. We head back to the steam to soften the beaver fur, and Eric gently bends the rim by hand. Then he uses a piece of felt he cut off the brim earlier to make a hat band with a working buckle that can adjust the size of the hat to fit the wearer. Hat prices start at $400. His shop's signature hat is $5,000. That one has real diamonds in the hat band buckle set. I love the way it fits. It sits on my head. When I had it made, there was no doubt I didn't have to break it in, no stretch, no shrink. It just it sits on my head the way a hat should fit. Eric, this is beautiful. And this, this is a cowboy hat. Only thing it's missing is a horse. Eric made this one for a real cowboy, but he's got one just for me to take home. Happy trails, my friend. Happy trails. <laughs> this cowboy hat so authentic, I think I'm going to have to get back on my horse and ride off into the sunset, huh? Can I call you Trigger? To make this instrument, an artisan cuts, glues, sands, or wires 2,500 individual pieces. And you hand make this? All in the name of building a classic, classical pianoforte. Ah. 
Ah, lovely. I wish I could play like that. And while forte piano may not be my forte, it is this man's. And not only does he play them, he also makes them. By hand? Yes. By hand. In Freeport, Maine, inside this quaint wood shop, the sounds of a saw are often interrupted by a lovely sonata. That's because Rodney Rogger makes 19th century classical pianos. To Rodney, the sound of a wooden piano is music to his ears. Making them is music to his soul. First of all, tell me, is it forte piano or piano forte? Because I've heard it both ways. Forte is Italian for loud, piano is Italian for soft. Forte piano, piano forte. The term is a little bit ambiguous. Uh -huh. uh, what during, do you call it? I call it a wooden frame piano. <laughs> <laughs> or I call, it, I call it an early piano. If classical period composers, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven were to be reincarnated, they would sit down one of these instruments, play it, and go, oh, this is the instrument I know. Rodney starts with local New England white ash and traces a template onto a milled board. He cuts the shape on a bandsaw, runs it through the joiner, and then the planer. Next, he cleans it with a hand planer and scratches it with a tooth planer so it will hold some glue. He does that 120 times and then just the frame is ready to assemble. But what happens is there are a lot of little pieces. Oh, we're doing the puzzle, aren't we? That's right. And then there's a second layer on top of it, but that layer overlaps like that. So this layer above strengthens all these glue joints below. Once the frame is built, glued, and dried, it's very strong and weighs about 400 pounds. It's heavy for a reason. This framework will eventually withstand 10 or 11,000 pounds of string tension. The wooden frame is what resists the string tension. These are machines, and there is a certain amount of string tension. If you deny that, the instrument collapses. Talking about parts, do you happen to know like a guesstimate of how many different separate parts are in a piano? There are probably 2,500 parts total. 2,500 <laughs> objects that are glued together for one of these instruments. And you hand make this? It takes Rodney about a year to finish one piano, so he usually has a couple in process. We have a finished instrument, finished case and frame, and the soundboard is in. This is a mechanical amplifier. Ed, let me show you something, okay? Okay. Um, What's that little thing? It's a little music, play it. There's a little music box. Okay, put it here, rest it on the bridge. Spin it now. Wow! <laughs> the soundboard's the soul for the instrument. This, this wooden object is now at the transition from being a wooden box to a musical instrument. The soundboard may be the soul of the piano, but the keyboard is the mechanical heart. The key lever is made of spruce. It's very stiff and very light and responds well to a player's touch dynamics. The naturals, or white keys, are made from cow bone, and the accidentals, or black keys, are made from ebony wood. This six and a half octave piano has 80 keys. When a player presses one, a hammer swings up and hits a string, creating the note. That's called the piano's action. The hammer swings up, hits the string, lowers, and is locked into place by a piece called the escapement. Every piece has its own hammer, which means Rodney makes 80 hammers. Let's make a hammer, Jill. Okay. It's a wooden core, which I've shaped to the hammer shape. And we're going to cover it with strips of leather. We're going to glue them on one layer at a time. So here is hot animal glue. When you say animal, like what's that made of? Skins and hooves of, hey, there's no such thing as a vegetarian musical instrument. <laughs> <laughs> you need to put a little dab of glue at the end of the hammer molding, fold the leather over, we'll glue one side, clamp it, and after that glue sets, we'll do the other side. And how many times do you have to do this? This is a treble hammer, so there are only three layers of leather. For the base hammers that are bigger, there can be six layers. Wow. The strings are the voice of the pianoforte. So here's the speaking length of the string. Which when is you what say count. speaking length. That's the, part that I, that's the part you actually hear. Okay. 
And if you did that down there, you wouldn't hear it? Oh. Right. No, you don't. The string length, the string material, the diameter, the pitch, and the tension are all closely related to each other. Mm. And ultimately, you, you set up the strings for a particular tension for this instrument. A finished piano forte like this one costs $60,000. That price buys a beautiful instrument and an eye-catching piece of furniture with authentic detail. What are these right here? Apollo's lyre is part of the iconography of any musical subject. Okay. I mean, you don't play it, but it's the- It's beautiful. Uh, here's just some parts. You get have an instrument ready to be assembled okay. where you're looking at the part of the instrument that's on the floor. Mm -hmm. Here's the stand. There are legs on either side. You, the player, are right here. There's a decorative molding, and the lyre is right at the player's feet. Um, it, would you please apply linseed oil lightly all the way around this surface? Okay. So the oil is soaking in, mm -hmm. and what we do is use some very fine sandpaper, and the oil is sanded. It the, pops. The pattern glows oh, when it's finished. So beautiful. This is one of the really wonderful things working with musical instruments. The people who buy instruments from me expect to have beautifully finished, highly figured wood, just because that's part of the very nature of the character of these instruments. Woohoo! Like <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tobin would be proud. <laughs> This tinsmith makes Civil War era products that look right at home in a modern world. I the love that. The glass slides up so you can put a candle in it. Love that. I love a good cup of joe in the morning, but today mine is extra special. And here's why. In Janesville, Wisconsin, tinsmith Jim Feeble makes authentic, old-fashioned coffee pots and mugs, just like those used during the Civil War. Even as a boy, Jim loved making things by hand. When Jim met a blacksmith at a Civil War reenactment, he was inspired to learn his own 19th century trade. I have never seen somebody take on the tinsmithing as well as he did. This one here is a mess kit. It's got a canteen in it with a cup and cooking pans. Ooh, that this? one there is, they call a ship lamp. It just hangs, it's just a straight oil burner. Okay. And this is a little personal lantern. I the love The glass that. slides up so you can put a candle in it. Love that. What is it about 10 that you love working with so much? I like the layout and the design and then the forming and bending and shaping and soldering. And the item Jim is making is a coffee pot. Well, we're going to take this roll of tin and cut a sheet off of it to make the coffee pot body. So I just right. place the pattern up here and then make a raw cut straight up. Oh. All right. Not like cutting paper. <laughs> Jim uses a scribe to trace the pattern onto the tin. The next step we're going to do is to create this channel okay. right here, put okay. a wire inside of it, and then hammer it down for strength. And then it starts to make the channel. Okay. So now it's time to place the wire in uh -huh. the channel. So we'll get it started here. And you can't make a coffee pot without these the holes that actually allow the coffee to pour through the spout. The next step we're gonna do is put this bead right here in the coffee pot with a swedge. This is a swedge, it snaps down in the hole. So this bend is called a beading? A bead. And it gives this strength. It's just like when you see lines around a soup can, same idea. Jim uses wool or leather between the swedge and the tin to prevent scratching. Okay. I've done this area here and here and folded them okay. over. And now we just lock it together, we slide it over the stake, make sure it's nice and tight, and then set, start setting the seam down. Now are we going to solder this together? Yes. I prefer to uh, just start out with a piece at the top 
and kind of let gravity do its work as it melts down. It doesn't have to be perfect because then it looks machine made. Where this See. way is handmade, you can tell that it's handmade. Jim adds the handle and creates a lip for the bottom of the pot. So now we take our little mark right there yeah. that we made and we put the back seam on it. Okay. And the bottom fits all the way around. Yeah. Jim solders the bottom of the pot and now it's time for the true test. It's not leaking. The finishing touches include the top ring and the spout. Despite all of this hard work, Jim's coffee pots start around $40. That's quite a deal when you consider that Jim's products are built to last for over 150 years. I had a brilliant day today. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Wild West cowboy hats, 19th century pianos, and Civil War era coffee pots. These artisans all have the same goal. They want to do things right, not easy. And thanks to their commitment to authenticity, the past lives on in the present.